And welcome to the North Lincoln County Historical Museum. My name is Candace Dow. I'm the museum educator. And today our lecture series is going to focus on 60 years of history in North Lincoln County of Fire and Rescue. Our speakers today are Al Ball and Emil St. Clair. And with that, I'll just go ahead and let our speakers go ahead and tell us all about the history here in our area. Can and I ask one question yes, first? Yeah. Did you ever figure out who was who in the picture? Did not. <laughs> <laughs> you mean they wouldn't tell you? <laughs> well, I didn't call them to ask them. Oh. In fact, I tried to call Don Baker, and he's the gentleman that gave me the picture, our chief, and uh, he's been out of town. Yesterday, he's back, and he has his family with him, and they're going to have a picnic this afternoon. He said if they get through with that, why they will come with him. All right. Well, with that, I'll let you guys go ahead and uh, tell us your story. Okay, first off, i got a question. Anybody uh, know by one line is longer in a bee of grease, of geese? Because there's more geese in it. <laughs> 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 and that has to do with the fire department. <laughs> well, they're all kind of windy. <laughs> and there's been lots of geese lately. Right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, you yes, have one on here, or go back and get <laughs> you in trouble. and put on stuff and got enough money to buy the first fire truck which actually they ordered it in 38 and by the time they got everything together the first one we got here was in 1940 which is still here I think it's over in the fire hall in the, by the Dairy Queen now they are going to have it I think up in the new fire hall and uh, they uh, got that truck, and then they were just going to park it in the garage. And uh, Bill Lindine that owned the Pines and Chandler, and there was Parent and Hindle was pretty forceful and they said no we need a fire station and they uh, got together and decided that they would build a fire station and Mr. and Mrs. Robinson donated this chunk of ground right here and at that time if they ever moved or anything, this was to revert back to Robinson family. Anyway, it was here a long time and they got a group together and the lumber yard donated Krittner all the lumber for this building. They, I think, hired a carpenter 
there to, to, to run it. And most of it was all volunteer. And they built this hall the way it is today. And uh, it was dedicated in uh, 41. And they really worked when you stop and think uh, just a bunch of volunteers to build a two-story building and get this far along and they got it going and then they decided that uh, they needed another truck. Uh, Taft, Nell, Scott, and Lee Lake had went together to form a district I don't remember what year Country City came in, but it's like 55, 56, after they got the district formed and Cutler City came in and that, they never did change the name, it was always just TND. Eventually they got more trucks, they got the station in Lee Lake, and then they built another station up the river, and eventually we became Lincoln City in that time, and now we're one district with Ocean Lake, the Rhodes Lot, the whole section here is under one district. That's fairly recent though, isn't it? Right. It's, uh, what, two years ago? I don't know well, exactly, but it's about two years ago. Maybe, yeah, it's just about two years ago. Is, is everyone still volunteer? No. Uh, we have a paid chief, and we have a paid fire marshal and a paid training officer and of course we have uh, I don't know the correct titles for the ladies in the office but uh, the one up here has got some schooling in fire training and stuff. Mm -hmm. Irene but uh, it really had, it's almost past the size of being all volunteer anymore. It's, uh, the firemen, though, weren't they volunteer? Yes, all the firemen are volunteer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're on call 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Even if you're at work, mm -hmm. you can do it. <coughs> <coughs> You did used to have to be called on the telephone. But. <coughs> Originally. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of awkward, sort of a thing. Yes, I know. Once you got a call, you called two other people, and they called two other people. Yeah. I think in the um, Ocean Lake so that you could 
go to the fire and put the fire out, the siren would still be blowing. Yeah. Especially if some guy got a little nervous and plugged in the wrong hole. I used to live down the street at uh, St. Ballard and all of us lived, three of us lived right here close, so we generally was one of the ones that went out first. And I can remember about where uh, Burger King is now, there used to be a little grocery store, and it's set up on stilts, and it caught fire. And I don't know what I was thinking, I come up here, and nobody was here, and I opened the door, and I run over to the D Lake box, and I pull it out, and I put it in the four hole, and when St. and I went through Nelscott, I could hear the Nelscott siren still going. <laughs> So much paperwork now that it's it's really well it just about keeps one person uh, doing the paperwork and, and of course they have to have rules and regulations so the state's pretty strict on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the guys really have to train now. Uh, you know, just as we went to the fire and put it out and. We was pretty proud uh, to be on it. We had uh, used to. They had the state had two people hired to teach us fire training, and uh, they wanted to burn the hotel and all the people in the state go to school there, and they set it up. And, these two gentlemen's name, one was Mobley and the other was Dill, and they stopped here on the way down, and we was having one of those storms, you know, about 60 miles an hour winds and raining, and it was horizontal rain, 
So they stopped here and we were talking and getting ready to go down and they said, well, we ought to cancel it. And of course, I think it was Ralph spoke up and he looked at him and said, well, what are we canceling? Well, it's really storming. He said, well, when we have a fire, we just tell him, well, I'm sorry, we'll cancel it. <laughs> and they kind of looked at him and he said, well, I guess that's right. <laughs> they was gun shy. When we went down there and set that big building on fire, it was, it was down in... Uh, Newport? Yes, yeah, down on the Bayfront. What they call oh, it? Night? Night Beach. Night Beach. Or Abbey? Or no. No. Night Beach. Oh, the Abbey? Yeah. No. Yeah, it was. But it, we set that on fire and we had what we call an entry team. And the guys had practiced really good. And Boy, I tell you, they put on their turnouts and that mask and go into a fire and they put, drilled holes in the wall and put uh, clothes, which was hooked to a machine to tell you the temperature from at the ceiling and down 18 inches and all the way down. Mm -hmm. To show that you could crawl in on the floor and, you know, it might be 2,200 degrees up there, but it wouldn't burn you down here. And we did a lot of practice, and, and we was pretty hot shot. Uh, but, and uh, this two state gentlemen had us, our entry team down there, pretty much help instruct and lead through that. And that fire would roll in them rooms and come right down with just in, and just rolling in. Maybe 2,200 degrees or so up there. And a couple of guys melted a helm under two. And, what but, year? Oh, I afraid somebody asked. I really don't. I would say that was in, uh, I don't know if Bob was still chief. Yeah. Was he? So that would probably be what in the sixties? Well, I think a little bit before. But I took over nineteen sixty and he was he was chief, I think, when we mumbled him doing any time. They the state thought enough of us <coughs> evidently looking back and saying a people will tell you a little more about that. The cities have got a, a, a truck, a water truck, and they pumps on them, and they weren't really registered as a fire truck. And then they started passing these laws, and they, in fact, Bob Ballard and I think Chandler and a couple of guys went over to our state legislators and they got a couple of laws passed on insurance that they had to give you if you have certain steps insurance that you got 10% decrease if you was in this step in your district and uh, we get quite a few laws passed and it uh, this department really worked that way if you go back to some of the news clippings and it tells where they went over there and got a large and fast. In fact, saying you didn't have to help me. When that abandoned fire, the insurance companies along the whole coast canceled everybody's insurance. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter whether you paid it or not, they just canceled it. Mm -hmm. And it was. Because that wasn't a fire department, is that? No, they just, I, I really don't know what the they deal was. Have a reason? Well, yeah, money, because it cost. And so then they got along past that they couldn't just cast for first, you know, like that. And uh, there was, uh, they really, Ballard did a lot. He was uh, kind of a go-getter. Well, didn't Hasselbring work with your department quite a bit? I mean, he was in the Devil's Lake uh, Department. There's always been mutual aid agreements yeah. that we very, very well worked out. As a matter of fact, we responded to each other's fires. Yeah, I thought they did, because actually he like came across the river there. Or the, well, the 10th Street the out, used to be the dividing line. Yeah. 
I think that. it still is considered. Yes. Yeah. But we, we really always did a lot of uh, people thought there was more animosity. Yeah, <laughs> than there really was. You know, it's like anything. Well, you get to hear one person talk and, and there's you think there's a lot of animosity going on, but really when we needed right, each other we were there. And uh, we went to uh, Toledo to the mill once. Uh, mill caught on fire and he was passing one truck from each department down like Devil's Lake came here and we went sent one to Depot Bay and one went clear to the fire. They, it's still that way. It's You have mutual aid. In fact, I'm sure some of our people wonder why our firemen go up and start fighting force fire like last year up Anderson Creek mm -hmm. and all that. The guys was out. Wow. Like I, some time. I think there was like two nights and three days. But we have a mutual aid and actually the state's got a law that we're supposed to go and protect the building adjoining the timber. But the state calls us and the guys go and help try to knock it down until they can bring a truck from the, the closest one most of the time is Toledo. Well, and our uh, court was in um, Devil's Lake for 34 years, but it always seemed to me that uh, it's almost too bad to have it not be volunteer because the men almost felt like it was a club, that, uh, that they were bonded together by a mutual interest rather than by an income or... <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's... The larger departments is getting laws passed that make it harder for smaller departments, and eventually it'll have to be paid because you can't expect somebody to hold a job and work all day long and then go train at night and and not as extensively, I guess, as you right. And it it it, it really is a lot of hours. Uh, of training to keep. Well, I worked at the telephone company, and I know the Jack Sutton and Les Appolder and a lot of the guys, Dayton and everybody took off <laughs> phone frame, but. <laughs> but and, and that's still the day, but it, you'll find it less and less because. This day and age, the employer, some of the employers wouldn't dock you. No, they wouldn't. They just go ahead and pay you for the hours, and if you was there a couple hours, they just came out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. But this day and age, why you you don't see that so much? You either lose that money, or you don't go. And well, it's a little I, rough if you've got your own business. And you it really <laughs> is. Uh, my son-in-law has about five guys, and that phone ring, and five guys went out of that shop. <laughs> and, you know, his customers is there. So it, it makes it hard, and eventually it will be all paid. That's why you won't get your furnace fixed. <laughs> <laughs>
we try to bill the cover, bill them to cover for the gas and, and a little bit. And you know, it, I don't think there was ever a time the insurance companies never would gladly pay that. And I don't know if any of you remember uh, over at uh, Nesquian, the Sutton's house burnt. And they was pretty upset. We sent a truck, but uh, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to walk around the phone say, well, you know, I will send a truck, but you realize it's going to take us 15, 20 minutes or a little more to get there. And it's, your house is going to burn. Well, you still go. And, you know, it's just and the same way we went almost to the bridge there at Celeste on fires. I don't remember the people's names. It's a pretty good sized ranch uh, on the left hand side there and they had just filled a barn full of hay. And they picked up a load of hay on a truck and backed it in the barn because it was late and they always felt that the exhaust or something set it afire now. We saved their house. We didn't save the barn, but we sent a tanker and a pumper and we saved their house. And they was really happy. But uh, Was that on him? No, it's clear up almost to slats. It's a mile post, uh, I think it's 16. No, yeah, we went there, but this one's further up. Uh, can't think of their name. We had that problem with Cleveland. They, they wouldn't go out, if they had a fire on Eddie Miller out, almost to Florida. They wouldn't go. And of course, we in the forestry, we went out there, of course, by the time we got there, it was pretty well, but it, we didn't go into any structures during a fire because we weren't trained for that. We just kept from spreading into the timber. Well, it, back, uh, you remember we, it just, our department grow, and we really had growing pains, and we still got them. Uh, you know, really, the fire district and the bylaws says we are to fight fire. But there was nobody to call of automobile accidents, anybody got hurt, trapped, or anything, and they would always call the fire department, and they always go, and that's how we got into this water rescue. Way back when, some we, they bought a boat and they had a few times they went out and saved somebody, but it really got dangerous. They almost drowned a bunch of firemen, so they decided to get rid of the boat. And then for a few years, there was nobody. And then uh, Young Rowski and somebody tried to start a water rescue and they did a good job, but they couldn't come up with enough money for insurance. And the insurance is just out of this world. So they kept kicking it back and we got about five or six young fellows that got to ride in these jet skis, mm -hmm. and they got caddy with them. So they wanted to start water rescue. And the Coast Guard, it takes them, the least they've ever got here is in 25 minutes. Well, you're drowning, <laughs> you know, by then. It's hard to hold your breath up. And uh, <laughs> so, The old members on the board, and I'm going to point. <laughs> we had a board that, you know, they, they really, the, sometimes a young guy didn't think that the board was doing right, I'm sure, but Why we <laughs> talked to them and we said, well, we, if they was under our umbrella, their insurance didn't cost them as much, and so we said we'd give it a try. But they had to train, 
There had to be rules and regulations and all this, and, and the guys did a good job. And I didn't look it up, but I, I think you'd be shocked to find out how many lives they've saved. And the Coast Guard thinks they're just out of this world, because by the which all was out there, got the people back in. Maybe they was on their way to the hospital when the Coast Guard got here. And so it's uh, really worked good. It's hard to keep. Of course, the state said, now you will be training these guys. And they've got to train so many hours. And it's really hard because they've got to train, do their fire training and keep that up plus their water rescue, and I don't really know all the bylaws now, but they used to have to like swim across the jaws and back. Yeah, they have to be good swimmers to be out there, even with their wet or dry suit on. And, uh, well, uh, does the, um, the Coast Guard still have any kind of communication there at the dock? Or Anything that they like, they call us the police department, the first thing. Anybody see anything happen, they call the police department. She immediately calls the Coast Guard. And she tones out the fire. And then they, they send an officer and, and the guys are on the road to see what it is. And uh, they pretty much wait that few minutes till that first fireman get there to see if they need the Coast Guard because if they got them, you know, out of the water, everything, but they're going just them start. And uh, we had a few meetings with them, and uh, they are, they really work with the fire district and their helicopter, and uh, they did good. Well, did somebody have to? Oh, yeah. And then, it, and then we get in the medical part of it, you know, you got to, you go to a, a wreck, and you have to have first responders, and then if you do anything else, you have to be an EMT. Yeah. Well, uh, are all the, uh, the reason I'm asking is, are all the firemen uh, trained with EMT and uh, they, they have to be first responders. Because when that, Park had his heart attack, Doug Kerr was there jumping on the spot. And I, don't, I just called 911, but he was there. And the, you know, the guys can do I just take time. them down on the elevator? Uh, it's, it's, we've sat there and discussed it night after night, where now you're getting like, over 3,000 medical calls a year. It, it, I think, if I'm not mistaken, last year it averaged three a day. Of course, some days you get five, and the next day you might not get any, but I think it averaged out like three a day. And boy, that takes up a yeah, lot, a lot of time. And uh, you wonder, are we doing right? And then you talk to people, and, and we was always going to send out a slip, like in the, get the city to send it out with a water bill and ask the people in, in the district if they want us to go on all the medical calls. And they never did it, but uh, you wonder if they're doing right, where there's so many medical calls, but then you go see them save somebody's life. Why then? You know, who's going to say no? I don't think we ought to do this. So it, it's a it's a catch twenty one. Well, I tell you, for the board to sit there and try to come up with. Uh, it seems like they sent so many out, like seven to ten. Right, so but you know, one of the I just deals. See it in the paper, right, and one of the deals for that. Used to, we thought, well, there's no use to send two trucks and ten guys. Yeah. But if you're a little late getting to the fire hall, and you say, well, you stay at the fire hall, <coughs> and 
don't go out, then you get disheartened. You don't even go from there to call. So it, it's kind of if they go, they feel they're doing something, and naturally a few of them that lives closer, their jobs is so they can be there first. Why they go there every time? But it is hard, and you. I know the taxpayer thinks, well, I wonder why they're running two trucks out there. Well, one truck starts from one station and the other one, until they get there, you don't know whether, and once you're two-thirds away there, why not go on and see if you can do anything. And Has anyone that's ever had a fire ever complained? No. <laughs> I don't think so. No, no I don't think so. But it's, uh, it is, uh, Kind of a, it's more than people realize. It's too bad sometimes that all the people don't go to a couple of those board meetings and, and see those five people are making some pretty big decisions this day and age. And uh, just like we were almost two years just paperwork of joining the two districts. And of course, then the name. You know, and naturally the people in the north end didn't want to be TND and the TND didn't want to solve that to come up with a different name. So, and there's just a lot of monkey business going on. Well, that's why it's Lincoln City instead of Orchard <laughs> I know, I wanted to get in there for my husband and so I called the ambulance company and they said, sorry, but you have to call 9-11. And I said, but I don't want the, all the fire departments and everything else to come out. Well, you still have to call 911. So then I called 911 and explained again I didn't want all the fire trucks and stuff, so they couldn't get up there anyway. And so, um, you know, or sirens and mm -hmm. everything. And so, but why well, I had to call 911? And then they tell you, well, don't call 911 if you're <laughs> gonna hog up the telephone, so you never know what to do. <clears throat> well, you know, they tell you that. But anytime you need anything, you call 911. That's their job. And if you ask I, them I, not I, to run with a siren, mm -hmm. uh, we've been on calls, and they ask you not to run with a siren. And, hey, that's fine. Just turn mm -hmm. the lights on and go. You don't have to run with a siren. We, we've had a little back and forth with the city. The city did controls the dispatchers, and uh, I think it's working better now. And, but the dispatchers are there. They're your servant, and that's what we're paying them for, and they're the call. And if you've got a complaint, you get a hold of the mayor or the city council or the chief. And they'll straighten it out. It's, uh, and we all make mistakes, and sometimes we need somebody to say, hey, we, we should do this, we should do that, but... Uh, when you're paying for 911 on your telephone bill, too. Right. <laughs> you own property here you're paying on? Mm -hmm. You're paying on your phone bill? And well, the sirens Sand. are surely a lot more frequent these days, aren't they? <laughs> Yes. It was kind of siren. By doing medical calls. And used to we just went on wrecks. And our ambulance is a private ambulance. And they've got like two ambulances here. Well, you know, in the summer night, there's yeah. 150,000 people Sounds here like in our. New York City. Mm -hmm. And they're both out of town. Why? Well, then there's nothing but uh, the fire department. And it, it just makes it. I see here a while back where they, uh, you've got to have different stuff and different insurance to transport. Now, transporting is the easiest part of it. And <laughs> it's being known what to do sitting there with that person. But I see uh, we bought an ambulance from Tualatin, or not an ambulance, it's actually 
built by pamphlets, but uh, it really was just to transport the EMTs to the calls. To the emergency vehicle or something? And, uh, now, now they can transport with it. They've got it. But St. Utah for a while. <laughs> I uh, guess I probably should preface this letter a little bit. I've been through all the chairs. I started, we came here in 1946, and I think I was in the, in the fire department along about 1949 or so. It happened that uh, I was burning some good magazines as a little trash burner and there. My neighbor was Doc Johnson on one side, Sam Bowman on the other. So I was looking at these magazines and I hated to burn them, so I went over to Don's house and knocked on his door and uh, gave him the magazine. And of course, we had to shoot the breeze a little bit. But before I left, well, I put a piece of sheetrock between the, 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 the little trash burner and the wall. And uh, <clears throat> pretty quick, my, my wife hollered out the door, Oh, Saint, you're, you got the house on fire. <laughs> Next door, burger. Sam Crews. Bella, right? Oh, Bella. Um, yeah, Sam, and so I went trotting home. In the meantime, Sam called the fire department. Oh. <laughs> About three seconds later, I either came down the street. Man alive, I was standing out there, you know, <clears throat> thinking, what a heck of a bunch of guys, you know, they hear just like that. Well, I'm going to run all that down. It turned out that they were on the back of the truck and they were going to go out for practice. So instead of turning this corner, they turned the other corner and came down my street. But uh, it didn't take me long to kind of catch on. And maybe I'll have blown to that outfit. They put a good bunch of jokes. But anyway, I walked through all the chairs. And the only way you get rid of somebody, you know, just keep kicking them up there. And make them get rid of them, you know, and the place to put them. <laughs> so when Mr. Baker came aboard, why well, I, I figured, well, everything's going to be fine now. It's time for me to leave. No, he said, uh, we need a historian. So John, uh, uh, and I. So I didn't know what to do about all this. Sixty years, nobody kept any history because all volunteers, who, who does that? So John Johansson and myself, well, we scratched our head for, I don't know, we didn't do any, anything about this for almost a year, I guess. So finally, a plan started to form and come along, so we, uh, we uh, Maybe the only place to get history was for the newspapers. So we started in on, a, on that. And <clears throat> actually, uh, it's taken us several weeks. Um, uh, I, I spent about three hours a day, about three days a week. I was eight to nine hours a week. And we just the other day put it all together. And what it is, it's just all. Uh, show you just about what, what I've done over there in between John and I. <clears throat> but our first thought is to put a directory together or a reference. So we each little item in the paper we made a date, time, notation of it, so that this directive will be available for the museum, for the library, for the, and the north and south fire station. I started with the News Guard, and uh, all of their archives are put together in the book form. So you pretty much have to write out in detail what each little article is you're going to cost. The library, everything is put in the box just loosely. So there we have a, a chance of running from uh, a pictorial story. In other words, we can get a picture taken and a little byline that goes with it. So. 
we pretty much have a plan to there again run about four copies of each. Plant one here, museum, in each fire station. Right now, and that's that's about where we are. The museum or the library is supposed to get a new copy. And uh, I think it's going to be very good because some of this old news print is about the color of the, the dark mm -hmm. print on the wall mm -hmm. and the new copiers will come out with the white background and very dark lettering so it's going to work out fine for Anyway, to kind of kick this thing off, why I, I called, uh, well I actually wrote Bob down the letter. Now Bob is 84 years old he and he lives in Yuma, Arizona with his with his wife Barbara, and, uh, and we've been in touch back and forth ever since he left, and we've been gone for quite a while. But anyway, I asked for certain things about the early date and all these happenings, and he's got a memory like we wouldn't believe. It. So I have a book written here by Bob, and all the things that he that I asked about, like. The water rescue and what happened in those days, and, uh, and that, the, the building and the fire station here, and the, the trucks, and getting all of this business put together. Um, and actually, in going from here and through the newspapers, there's several pretty great stories that's going to develop from this. Mm -hmm. One of the things is, the, uh, like Al said, they have to go to the legislature and get laws passed so that a city here and a city here could all be involved in a fire district. And what involved them was a bunch of elections. You know, you, you, they had to have elections for them to come in. The fire district had to have elections to allow them in, and then basically it all got put together. Very similar to all the town, little borough and everything joined together. So I put all of that show together and uh, it's working out great, but if you bear with me, I'll, I'll read you up uh, Bob's letter. Feel free to jump in at uh, any point here if you want me to go over again. Dear St. John, that's uh, Joanne's Says, I have been very busy for a retired man, and your good letter of 2 1399 has been on my mind. I will try to, in this letter to do the best I can for you. And he said, As I am indicated in my phone call to Saint, I believe that the story of the TMD started sometime before the dates that you have listed. I arrived in Taft December 31, 1936. I believe the band of fire happened on or before 1936. The entire band in the area was surrounded by the, the greasy weed or plant of gorse now is what he's referring to. Uh, when it all took off and there was no stopping it, the town was lost. Little or no fire protection, so that got things kind of thinking. It goes on to say, as I recall, as a result, Oregon or Mutual of Menville canceled all fire policies in our area, and they, and they had the most of them, including mine. It says, as a result, like hitting a mule in the head with a two before, this really got our attention, and I credit this to be the pre start of TMB Fire District. Page two. <laughs> I'm not sure <clears throat> of at this time whether or not the state laws included fire districts, but I remember that the original uh, millage was so low that there was no way that a standard pumper could be purchased. Delegations from our area, probably some of which were or later were original TMD fire board members, visited the legislature of Salem and were successful in getting the millage raised to an operable level. They used a Salem attorney who 
I think would be called a lobbyist, to which I will refer later. Prior to the delivery of the new truck, TND fired board Bill Lundeen, former Nelscott Fish Market, and later the Pines Hotel, with approval of the TND board appointed me as fire chief. It was up to me to organize the, the uh, volunteer firemen and take care of all the details in accordance with the board's orders and approvals. I had previously been a member of the local 2030 club with its meetings at the Dorchester House. Conveniently, the 2030 club had just disbanded Bill Harder. Uh, he was of Ocean Lake Lumber and of Taft was my first assistant chief. Other 2030, 2030s living in the TND district joined without exception. And this was the core of the, to start from. Now they sure had a break there because it, it had a group of firemen just mm -hmm. right off of that. And number page three, this is, has to do with the fire hall. Some controversies arose on plans for the new fire hall within the board. Some conservatives and some go all the way guys just Instead of a shed for one truck, the final go all the way guy won in the two station, two truck station meeting room, shower, toilets, sleeping room, upstairs hall with restrooms and kitchens. Uh, as it is now. And a very ardent volunteer of labor and ideas with guests guessing was elected at the next election to be placed on the most conservative by a write-in vote. You've got to understand that they worked at Bob's 84 years old. <laughs> and he admits to this that he's, he's oh, that pretty good. <laughs> Actually, a contractor was hired with two of his partners, McIntyre, later the Justice of the Peace to do overseas and oversee and base work. Continual labor was welcome and appreciated. The building bee lasted several days laying up floors and erecting the upper studs and trusses. Businessmen were not able to help hired men to place them. All others were there. And the next thing was fire insurance rates. I asked him about then, as now, there was a substantial insurance rate discount of from 10 to 20 percent basics were to have a standard 500-gallon fire truck with hose, nozzles, and equipment, and a trained fire personnel. Okay, that's we nope. found a note from Getham when, when we did some remodeling here in the building, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Katrina's probably told you about that in a beer can that mm -hmm. was in the wall. It was in the wall. <laughs> oh. It was a world board or something but, saying that uh, they volunteered? Uh, there was a little, right, there was writing on a little board in the wall and there was a golden glow beer can or a metal <laughs> beer can with a screw on cap. <laughs> They I are in we, the, I think we put it in the fire display yes. that we had. Uh, <laughs> he didn't say who the conservative person on the board was. No, that. apparently there were, there were several little oh, going uh, back and forth uh, about doing this. And I guess the people who wanted to go all out and, and do it right went out. Um, <clears throat> beyond the basics, you were graded by the Oregon Fire insurance rating bureau, that was the rating uh, people at the time, on water supply, hydrants, alarms, and so forth. In our case, the ability to buy insurance with basic and the discount on insurance overpaid the, the small village charge. Meet the new fire truck. Apparently, they, they'd already ordered it. <coughs> This was another one of my questions. At the appointed day and time, many people with cars, flags, and banners awaited the coming of the new truck at Otis Junction. Upon its arrival, a parade was formed, a 
the siren and blowing a horn honking. The first stop was at Delay, board member C.W. Chandler at an associated station there. And he wanted to be able to furnish the first gas for the truck. The next stop was in Taft in front of the Lincoln Theater. Many pictures were taken of the board members and the chief and the fireman and after everyone had made their inspection and the group went to Bill Huntington's Taft Grill where he furnished coffee and donuts and the new chief made his first speech to the TND taxpayers. And what was the date on this? At 41? Well, that would have been about right. Uh, I think we have it in this, this black book. Yeah. Yeah, when we got right. the first track, yeah. the first track was got at uh, 5.24.40. And the fire hall was dedicated 3.18.41. Oh. They kept oh. it yeah. for a little while, as I understand. Bob Ballard had the service station. Uh, I can't. Was it Richfield? I forget. Texco. Texco over here at the corner. Yeah, across, the, across the highway. Uh, over where. No, uh, where the motel, motel is. is. Well, across from the motel oh. where it used to be El Rey Arco or. You know where Davidson's had their restaurant? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Pex okay. used to have a mm -hmm. shell station there. Mm -hmm. Ballard had that before he came over here. Mm -hmm. And then they built this building over here later. But that was the, <coughs> according to the pictures and the dates in the Shade on that door. And it didn't even dawn on me for a minute. 
in a minute. Just, it was full of smoke. <laughs> and I says to my wife, Mom, get in the car and get it out of here. The house is on fire. And she says, what? I says, take the car out of here and get it out on the street, out of the road. And Bacon's lived just a little ways from her. And her mother says, I'll go over to Bacon's and call. And I said, okay. So I checked the front door. It wasn't that hot, but it was full of smoke, so I opened it real slow, because sometimes you open it and it just like blow up. Mm -hmm. And it, I did, it was fine, and I thought, what did we leave on that would set this place on fire? So I crawled in, and I thought, furnace, it was one of those old oil floor furnaces. I thought, it must be that. So I crawled in there, and I thought, oh, I, there's the phone right there, I'll call. Well, Saint answered. That was at the time that we had phones, and I, I said, "Saint, this is Al. And our house is on fire. Roll that thing." <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, the house laying down, and it's smoke built down there. So I hung up, and I thought, "Well, I'm going to crawl in there and see where this." I could hear it burning, but I couldn't see any flames. So I crawled around the corner and started down and. The wife's mother and the two girls that was their bedroom. And she was having a little trouble with the mildew in the closet. So uh, I thought I'd be smart. And I said, oh, I'll just leave that 100 watt light bulb on. It will be enough heat that it won't. Well, evidently, when she left, used to the ladies wore hats and these hat boxes, you know, got knocked over. When we left against that and it set that thing up. Oh. It burnt through the floor of the closet, through the ceiling, burnt the door of the closet into the bedroom. But when I got to there, I knew what it was, so I went back out and sink was coming. I could hear him coming. And <laughs> I got out there and I motioned for him to come right up in the, on the lawn. I was going to drive right in the house. I wanted to. <laughs> And at that time, you remember I said that the chief generally drove a smaller rig and got there. Well, it was a what we called a high-pressure rig. It had pump, I don't remember, but it you could pump 600 pounds of pressure and just turn water to fall. And really, it is the best thing it, to this day, fall on fire, because it cools so much faster than a large amount of water. And... Uh, so uh, we didn't even have our turnouts or anything, and I grabbed that hose and sank, put it in gear, and he was going to follow me in, and I guess I skinned his fingers going around the door, but anyway, you couldn't see, you had to hang on the hose. Went around there and opened that door in one shot. Mm -hmm. just, I just aimed just it in there in one shot, and it just killed that. Mm -hmm. And then all you had to do was mop it up. And the rest of the trucks come, but I tell you, don't be a fireman and have a fire because <laughs> you never live it down. <laughs> well, they used to tell us there's more people got hurt going to a fire than the actual fire. <laughs> That's true because you, you know, yeah. adrenaline gets to grow going and you have a tendency to drive a little too fast and you really don't know what's going to happen. Well, we had where you get close to a forest fire. And of course, sometimes you get into an awful thick smoke on the road and you have no idea if someone's coming out. You just kind of hope and pray that nobody's coming. Sometimes you even get hurt before you leave the house. Fireman, he will verify this. When you take off your turnout gear, you take off your hat, you take off your jacket, and you Take your spender down and you take your trousers and push them down over your boots. And you leave the suspenders hanging out. Then you put your hat back on this little man who's about this hard. That's what your kids call the little man. And you put the little man where you can find it in the dark. So when you go to find you just jump in, pull your spenders up, grab your hat, slap it on your head, grab your jacket, and you're out the door. Well, this one called. I didn't want to wait. So I'm 
fair lot of men went around the corner and I was attacked. By your turn, huh? By a house cat. Oh. <laughs> Had to be laying right on a rug just outside the door in the dark and stepped right in the middle. And he hit me with all four feet. So I had to have first aid for him. I was a mess. I get to add a little bit to this. <laughs> this call was at the Pines Hotel. And this person was a little bit inebriated. Ballard <laughs> took the call. No, it wasn't the <laughs> Ballard took the call. And I got a ear right behind Ballard. We jumped in a little truck and we had a inhalator and resuscitator and oxygen and all. So we got over there and they'd actually passed out from the alcohol. So they really thought you pull something, but just give them a little oxygen and it seemed to, to dilute that alcohol and clear them. They were all right. And about that time, here come Uncle Saint. Blood all over him. <laughs> we thought we could have to work on it. <laughs> uh, Saint, what happened? He says, well, this is going to take a little while. <laughs>
celebration of that <clears throat> of the big day the truck was taken to Ballard's garage and that's attacked it's attacked to a brief road. It <clears throat> was housed here for free till the station was ready. I left out the sentence. Page six. Now this one will get you right here. <laughs> you will never see again the level of pride of ownership <clears throat> and enthusiasm that the taxpayers and the general public had for this project and for the volunteers. Anytime the unit was on the streets, everyone would holler and wave and unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And that was that was the spirit of the, of the day. It was a reward. It was a really wonderful reward, wasn't it? You bet. Yeah. For many years, Fireman Everett Chandler and uh, son of C. W. I guess is another Chan Chandler. Well, I he think was Howard could tell you. No, his, his Everett was my wife's brother-in-law. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Just kind of hitting close to home, isn't oh, it? Yeah. <laughs> Webster. Pardon? Was that Webster? Oh, that's my name, yeah. Yes. Who would CW be? Is that? That was the that was the old man. Oh, I see. And he he had the service station and he had one well, there was four or five cottages there, and then they built the big house that's still there. Anyway. Oh, we went through you know, the bread and breakfast. Oh, well, you mean Chandler's? Chandler's. So. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, the uh, photographer and area photos finishing, I guess that's what he did, kept the department well supplied with pictures, which I in turn supplied to the local paper with articles of information of what we were doing, and I think that kept the public interest up. Yeah. And um, Bob, you'll notice through, and I've noticed through all the old papers, that he had something going all the time. Oh, yes, and, and when he when he died, his wife, who was Jen. Howard's wife's sister, uh, who was a good friend of Janice Kangas, said, I don't know what to do with all of these pictures and negatives that my husband left. She said, I thought about this burning them. And Janice said, no, don't get them to the museum. So we have the pictures. It's it's pictures got the camera on. Yeah. And the negatives too. I asked him about the lifeboat, and he goes on and says, Hans Efferman had cottages on the property later <coughs> occupied by the city parking lot by the fire home. He was a former man of the sea. He built plywood square stern boats to row six men with the tiller at the stern, and he donated it to the fire department. We were excited about it and had <clears throat> boat practice on Sundays. Freddie Robinson was on the crew and had some training which he learned from, from him. On a flood tide and a low surf, we would cross the bar, practice, was mostly in the bay. It was used to bring injured and <clears throat> dead from the spit. Problems that occurred <clears throat> were that fishing time, uh, people intent on catching the fish would go past the limits and on outgoing tide and rough surf and we would send a, a sound car down and warn them and a few would turn back and mostly they would ignore or thumb their nose. And when these same people got in serious trouble, the surfboard would be called for. No way could we respond. We would want to give the, the boat to the Boy Scouts for lake work. We did have a leather harness for swimmers with a tagline. <coughs> we did not res have a resuscitator and first aid. We did have, yeah, quite a bit. Later, improvements for the surplus. What we able to do, surpass what we able to do. Um, this harness, the Australians have a, a surf rescue of swimmers that were 
they could do the max. Their method was to take a little buoy, tied behind the harness, and they would swim out to a person in distress and actually extend themselves to where they were totally exhausted. There was no way back for them. They just didn't have the strength. But they would go that distance, and if they could uh, get a hold of the victim, why then it was up to the beast crew to pull them back. Now, we had such a, a thing here, and we had a rescue that was performed by it. Uh, now, if you have your own people on the line, it works fine. But you have to have another team along with this team, and that's to fight off the, the look, onlookers. They don't want to jump in there and start this with the rope. And pretty quick, you got those four guys out there under the surface. Well, and now, did the swimmer uh, rest with the buoy? Is that right? It could, uh -huh. yes. It uh -huh. was about that long and that tapered edge. You could get a hold of that and, and just bring it down uh -huh. under your chest. And the harness was in, in such a way that as you were towed back, the, the fastened back here, you could plane yourself in the water and keep the victim. The head up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it worked out pretty well as long as it didn't have help. We <laughs> <laughs> We had a reel of a thousand, thousand yards, thousand feet, I forget which one. Yeah. And when you get that, make the line out in the water, every time you pull real hard, it pulls down. And we got grounded a lifeguard. That was a lifeguard. Remember when they had the A-frame there at D River yeah. and the kids all swam in the... We, the city hired a lifeguard. And somebody got the surf out there. And the fire department went up there and he says, I'll take that out. So they put that harness on him and this this little, uh, actually it, it, that was before we had the nylon which floated a little better than the old mm -hmm. hemp rope. And uh, he went up, clear past the breakers and got the child. But got too many volunteers help pulling, and every time he'd holler to knock it off, why they thought he wanted to pull harder, and they'd pull harder, and they'd, he had, he was sick for a day and a half after he got in, because he was trying to hold on to the child, swim with one hand to keep his own head out of the water, and he drank so much salty water that he was actually sick. It didn't kill him. No, no, no and, and he hung on to the child. And who was that? I mean, the names mm -hmm. in there, but uh, he was a young fellow, I think, was from Salem, but I'm not sure that's where he's from. But we learned a lot about what to do and not to do. Mm -hmm. We uh, inherited a, a Coast Guard line gun. I'm going to tell you about that at another time. <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> I think you got to tell a we, lot of stories. In ADAC, Alaska, where the, the last first shot was fired. <laughs> <laughs> the last and final shot, I just pooped out there.
sin. At the time I was appointed chief, I decided I would resign everything else and dedicate myself to becoming the best chief I could be. And he was. During my 20 year tour, I worked very close with Oregon's Insurance Rating Bureau. I met with them often and for suggestions of next improvements that would help our insurance rating, which would I would present to the board for their consideration. These things were evident as a department grew more <coughs> fire trucks, salvage trucks, big station sirens, radio safety equipment for firemen, and the station. I always felt TMD had an A1 rating with the rating bureau and the state fire marshal's office. I was honored to be elected as president of the Oregon Fire Chiefs Association in 1958. The convention was held in Klamath Falls, which my wife Ida and I and daughter Mary attended with me. The TMD board provided funds for four or five days to attend these conventions and seminars each year, which kept us up to date. I did my best to have a planned fire meeting every Wednesday night. We would often give a small prize to the winner of each evolution, and the guys claimed that they won every one of them. But, uh, the uh, pool table kept firemen in the station after the meetings. Whereas I felt that I did my my part as best I could. I believe that the caliber and dedication of all the other volunteers are responsible <coughs> pardon me, for the success of this fire department. Was that in this building that he's talking about? The pool table was up here? No, it was down, down. where uh, it was down where the fire ladder came through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> Downstairs doesn't look much like it was no. when you were here. No. There was a little back room back there. Where this they doesn't look in. like them either. <laughs> no. Um, most proud of my 20 years of service as chief of the TMD Fire Division of Bob Dowler. Who is Bob yeah, yes. yeah. This, uh, talking about that fire ladder, you know, I mentioned that we got down to like 12 firemen at one time, and uh, we were trying to get more people interested. And we talked to four or five guys, and maybe some of you remember Johnny Bolton. Mm -hmm. He worked for the water district. Well, he was one of them, and uh, Holtz, and I don't remember who all. So we invite him down to look at watches one Wednesday night, and back in that room we had a leather couch along the wall where the truck backed in there, and uh, the guys come down, and they were some of them playing pool, and, and Johnny Bolton and Holtz and a few of them sitting on this here leather domino, and uh, some of us were out working on trucks, cleaning up, and this first truck that was here that we got, this old 40, the ladder stuck out about four feet longer than the truck. And uh, somebody was working on it, and the key was just a toggle switch right on the steering wheel, and it had was turned on or something and it happened to be in reverse. <laughs> and Bob Wright lived across the street. And when he went by, they said, Bob, hit that starter once for us, will you please? And he reached in there to hit the starter and that thing fired up and that jammed that ladder right through that, right over their heads. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I would scare no, them to <laughs> They didn't know whether they wanted to join this fire department or not, but I'll tell you, it, it woke up a lot of people. <laughs> was, there, was there an inside parking place?
place for the tracks and yes. which, which end? Well, it was on that side in that first and the back end. We just backed in. Well, and then that meeting hall was behind it. And it was just a plywood wall there. And it rammed that uh, ladder right through there. It was on the... This is the highway out here. That's right. You backed in this way. The big doors off was on this the, street. Off 51st yeah. Street. 50th. 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 And it backed uh, in. And then the other truck. On, on that... On that... Was the big door. Uh, and, and those big doors, like I say, overgrown kids driving these trucks <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, the same clear until they drove the first truck out on that side, and it seemed like they lived so close, and they took the second one out on this side. Those days, we didn't have the money to have automatic garage door openers, and there was a rule. Try out. So there, so you can reach up and pull the door closed and stuff. Well, the booster lines on these trucks, we call them horns, and they was up so that when you was pulling the holes around them, they'd roll, and you could pull it out there, you know, and the reel come off. Well, those reels set up above the cab, and once or twice in our time here, that rope would get stretched, and then it was just a, and it hooked that horn, and it jerked that door right back down on the truck when you drive it out. There was the bottom section of that door. Well, you know, then all the firemen would pick on that poor guy. <laughs> so, the number one truck really had to turn going out of here. This side over here had a little more, well, our chief cut the corner a little bit and he, the finish board on this door over here got ripped right off there on the way to the fire. Well, we give this, him a bad time. And, uh, Don't they kind of uh, dedicate a certain portion of the yearly banquet to <laughs> explaining all these things? To right. The <laughs> yes, occasionally we do. And I have a short video that will oh. watch after this. I know, I must leave town. <laughs> 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 There's no one that doesn't know me on here. <laughs> but you know, a bunch of guys, they just, if you do make one mistake, they never forget. Oh, no. But we did some good, too. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. saved a canary once. <laughs> <laughs> we got a bar called down at the house right above. house is, the first house up on the right. There's a pretty good hill going up there, and boy, we went ripping up there, and that house was full of smoke. First thing you always try to do is go in and check to see if anybody's in there, you know, smoke or, or a heart attack or something. So, boy, we put on our stuff and went bailing in there, and there was nobody in there, and happened to, coming back out, happened to notice this canary in the birdcage, <laughs> and that little sucker was laying there in the feet <laughs> Somebody got the right idea. Let's see if we can revive that. <laughs> Save that little bird. Oh, and I'll the whole trick it. was worth it. Deal bad, dude. I'll never forget saving that little bird. Well, were the owners grateful? Yes, really it was. Well, you know, it's worth it. You know, they, they thought a lot of that little bird, but uh, it was, you know, and the guys have this, I guess, the, the, I don't know what I want to call it, but Here's a little bird in his feet there, and they said, well, that bird caught. <laughs> but we did a lot of good with our horse play, too. We saved a lot of lives. There's a lady lives, I'm going to say, about where Inman Road comes close to Calkin Acres up there. It's just up a little bit. And I don't remember the particulars, but she got caught. Her foot caught, her leg caught in something at her dock, and the tide come in, and when the fireman got there, the tide, oh the water was right man. to her throat, and guys went in, dived down, got her untangled, and got her out of there, and I'll tell you, that lady Love really you. thinks the fireman did a good job, but she was, you know, you can imagine yourself being there, 
and evidently somebody tried to help her, and you wouldn't think that tide moves very fast, but boy, it come right up on her, and she didn't think she was going to make it. She'd get out of that. Well, remember the movie that was made on Follett's River? That's what happened in that. The yeah, guy. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Too. Sometimes a great notion. Uh -huh. Found out he couldn't pump much. <laughs> Fire truck. Poor <laughs> kid. Well, you get to make chocolate cookies. <laughs> Does the bun you lose out, you chip it off. You were taking it out of the oil then, huh? Well, uh, they were getting their water from Gordon Creek up here, and there was no filter system on it. And, uh, <clears throat> Every time we'd go down in Cutter City to practice and use our hydrants, why well, they'd be mad at us for two weeks before they'd get the water cleared up again. <laughs> so we finally said to their water master, all right, you, you flush the hydrants, you get your ears chewed off, and we won't bother. Well, he did, and he didn't. <laughs> so when we had a baddie, why, it, we lost the punch right there. Lugged the truck up full of mud. We had men inside with fire hoses doing tank water, and all at once shut down, so they had to scramble and lost the fire right there. Almost lost the furniture store at the same time. Yeah, we had oh. enough water available from a hydrant across the street to that save the right. yeah. I think that's the heel in the uh, furniture store. Yeah. Then. But I don't know if it's that time or not he did, but I thought he did. I think. Well, he here was business, I think. Uh, yeah. We borrowed his truck, big furniture truck, to transport the I'm fire sure uh, fireworks for the 4th of July. Because you have to put them in the truck. And certain people can drive it and all this. We used to get it and then we'd park it in the fire on and we'd take it down. Most of the time on the dock. I think one year we just set it off the beach, but most of the time off the dock. I'm going to bring this water problem back to TND now. We finally, uh, I would say in Bob's administration, they cut off any fire response to cut the city. And it forced them to join the fire district. And everything was everything was fine. But now later on when 
the city took over the water systems here. Mm -hmm. Cutler City wanted to keep their own, yeah. and they had a real fight to get them to join us. But the, 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 fire, the fire department was concerned. Well, that was that was a, a very neat move because when people come out there expect to find clean water. Most of the water that's coming into the fire system now is goes through the treatment plant and the our impellers. We don't have to worry about cleaning the screens after every fire because there's no little pebbles in there. Even when John Bolton was the, the water master, why he would flush the system off from the, the end of 51st Street. And the firemen were very good about going out and flushing all the hydrants in our district.